it's going to be a program that's going to explore public education here in DeSoto County. And the focus is going to be how important the public schools have been for the economic development of the county um, and how the schools feed the economy, the economy feed the schools. Uh, Tom Pittman from the Community Foundation has helped us put that together. Uh, and on that panel will be Jim Flanagan, Corey Uselton, and Corey Haynes. Tonight. Thank you. Um, so please join us. You'll hear more about that, but uh, we hope you're able to come. We also, um, I need to note that this series has been funded by a grant from the Phil Harden Foundation, um, and we are grateful for that. And again, I want to give Tom Pittman another uh, thank you for helping organize this up here with us. Tom, of course, is with the Community Foundation of North West Mississippi, just across the square here. So the goals of this program is to, and we're doing six of these around the state, and uh, this is our third, uh, is really to engage with the ideas and the philosophies behind these sort of policy debates that we're familiar with. And what I've learned as I've read all on this subject a lot is that these are not, is that the sort of differences that you hear tonight are not just technical, but rather they reflect different ideas, different values. And so our goal is to better understand this and to have a civil, of ex, um, a civil exchange of ideas. And we also want to make sure that we have an ideologically diverse panel. So you'll hear people uh, kind of express opinions on a wide, from a wide range of perspectives. I imagine that we have diversity in the audience here. And so our goal is that we um, listen um, sort of respectfully and that even if you hear things that you don't agree with, that you still um, seriously listen to um, and, um, and to consider those opinions. Uh, we will have time at the end for audience questions. So if something, if someone says something that really gets you fired up, you'll have a chance to uh, share that. Um, let me introduce our panel tonight. Um, to my right is Nancy Bloom. Nancy is, is the executive director of the Parents Campaign. Their vision is to engender a public education system that affords all students <coughs> excellent public schools so that children can become what they dream. Their mission is to ensure a brighter future for Mississippi children by the promoting better public schools through parent advocacy. By giving parents a means by which their voices can be heard, they are working together to change our state for the better. That comes, again, I'm sort of quoting from their official statements there. Uh, next to Nancy is Grant Callen. Grant is the founder and president of Empower Mississippi, which is an independent nonprofit advocacy organization dedicated to removing barriers to opportunity so that all Mississippians can flourish. Empower believes that Mississippians should have um, an opportunity to make choices that improve their lives and they envision a Mississippi where every child has access to a high quality education and parents have the freedom to choose the best educational setting for their children. Um, they've also been very active in working for, 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 for criminal justice reform here in Mississippi. And uh, at the far end of the table is Rachel Tanner. Rachel is the executive director of Mississippi First. Mississippi First tran uh, champions transformative policy solutions ensuring educational excellence for every Mississippi child. They are dedicated to advancing the best education policy ideas through research and analysis, public awareness, and issue education, advocacy, implementation, and evaluation. So please give a hand to our panel. Um, all of them came up from Jackson, so we are very appreciative of that. Um, so, uh, watch, right? Um, so since uh, uh, I'm a historian by training, and I do want to take just a few minutes at the outset to give a little bit of history um, of public education in Mississippi, I think it'll help put this conversation in context. So bear with me, all have heard this before, so you all can tune out and get something to eat. Um, the question of public education really goes back to the earliest white settlement in the state. As early as 1802, pre-statehood, there was an address given by the territorial governor, W.C.C. C. Claiborne, which he calls for a system of free public schools. Um, it doesn't go anywhere. In the 1840s, there is a debate in the Mississippi legislature about whether to create a statewide system of public schools. Um, although the resulting plan failed largely due to their unwillingness to raise taxes to pay for it. And from the context of the 1840s, the idea of public schools were seen almost as a luxury. Right? Farmers didn't think they really needed public schools. Craftsmen learned their trade 
through the apprenticeship system, and it was illegal to educate the, the majority of the population who were enslaved. So at the time, wealthy Mississippians sent their children to private schools or hired private tutors, and there was no consensus among the elites that a taxpayer-funded system of public schools would be beneficial. All right? This changes after the Civil War. And as the Reconstruction government creates, finally, a public school system, in part to help educate the free slaves, um, as well as others. So in 1870, Mississippi creates its first public school law, establishes a system of statewide free schools that will be financed by a school tax and authorize school boards and counties and, and municipalities to build schools to meet local demands. Um, of course, as we know, um, at that time, separate schools for whites and blacks were created, and this was codified in the 1890 Constitution, where we had a dual system of white schools and black schools. Um, this system was challenged by the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, though white Mississippi was particularly resistant to this ruling. In the mid-1960s, one of the responses to these federal mandates was what was called a freedom of choice policy. Um, and it was a way of, in a sense, preserving segregation by giving each family a choice of which school they went to. But in reality, oftentimes blacks stayed in black schools, whites stayed in white schools, and blacks stayed in black schools, whites stayed in white schools. And there were social pressures brought to bear to ensure that was the case. Um, also, in the 1960s, the, the legislature created a system of tuition grants to help white families afford private schools, which were growing um, at significant rate at the time. This growth increases even more after 1970, after the federal courts rule that the state had to finally integrate its public schools. And in many parts of the state, large numbers of whites left the public schools to establish private academies. Um, quite, um, um, uh, quite clearly, um, as clearly stated, to, to sort of maintain racial segregation. Before 1964, there were only three <coughs> non-parochial private schools in the state. By 1970, there were 236 total private schools in the state. And the number of private school students triples between 1966 and 1970. Um, in many places, public resources were used to support these new segregated private schools. Um, putting aside the issue of integration, which may come up and may not tonight, but Mississippi has always ranked low in educational outcomes. Before 1982, for example, Mississippi was the only state that didn't have a public kindergarten program. Only 45% of children who began first grade ultimately finished the 12th grade, and the state had the nation's second highest illiteracy rate. Um, about 10% of children did not attend school at all because of weak attendance laws that had been passed during the era of school integration. And very few children attended preschool compared to three out of four nationally. Um, um, I think um, only one in 20 children attended preschool at the time. Uh, the Educational Reform Act of 1982, which is looked back upon as this great achievement, but what people need to understand is it was a tough fight, and there's been documentaries done about this, and so the idea that it was, well, of course they would, you know, improve this. Um, it, it was a big battle, and it barely passed during a special session, and it worked to change this. And so the question of raising revenue to improve public education has always been a fight. Um, in 1997, see I'm jumping forward quickly, I'm almost to the end. In 1997, there's the Mississippi Adequate Education Program, uh, which was passed to help raise student achievement and to lessen, decrease the funding divide between wealthy and poor districts. And we'll talk a little bit later about how successful it's been in doing that. But it's created a funding formula um, to help ensure what it called a basic adequate level of school funding. And since the formula's creation in 1997, 22 years ago now, the legislature has fully funded the formula, I think, twice. So, so again, this helps kind of set the ground terms of our conversation uh, tonight. I want to start um, with a question with the panel that's kind of a big picture question, and it's kind of a, a summary question. It's a big question that y'all could write books on. So I'm looking for, you know, kind of just to hit the, the high points that we'll come back to later on in the conversation. But give us a sense of your view of the state of public education in Mississippi today, and how do we make it better? Do we need to make it better? Who wants to start? Um, well, I think that 
we ha we are making it better. Um, we've been improving for years, for for a couple of decades. Mississippi has outpaced the rest of the nation, the, the the national average, in improvement on our national test scores. So we've been improving for a long time, and recently that improvement has accelerated a little bit. Um, and so we are improving. We need to keep improving, and and some of that. Um, it's going to take some additional resources. We know we know what works. We what know works. what works. Well, we we've seen we know that that high quality pre K works it makes a tremendous difference. Um, and what do we have? Four percent. What percent of our kids are in in the collaboratives? Mm -hmm. in, okay, in the collaboratives, it's about four yeah. percent. So we got to do better. Um, <laughs> um, we know that the literacy coaches have made a big difference. But we don't have those in, in even half of our schools, let alone all of our schools. So we, we and, and yeah, math coaches help. We need more counselors. We, there are all kinds of, we know that smaller class sizes, particularly in high poverty school districts, make a tremendous difference. So we know the things that really make a difference. Um, it's, it's a matter of political will, about whether or not we are going to invest in those things at the level that our neighboring states do, that the rest of the nation does, and that we need if we're going to, to reach our full potential. I mean, Mississippi children are as bright and full of promise as the children in any other state. And if we provide them the resources that other states provide their children, I, I, I would wager that our children would exceed most other states. I think um, we're a scrappy people in Mississippi, and we make we do well with, with a little bit. But when you insist on starving and starving and starving your public schools, you really um, make it difficult for the children to, to, to meet their potential and for, for teachers to do everything they need to be doing. Great. Uh, Brent, what are your thoughts? What's the state of education in the city today, and how do we make it better? Um, so I'm delighted to be here, first of all. Anybody that's going to come out on a 160 degree yeah, day. Hot night, <laughs> and yeah. This is education policy. I appreciate it. And I love this. This is, this is fun to me to sit around and talk about these things. Um, so I would agree with some I certainly would agree. We've seen improvement in recent years. Um, I think most of the improvement has not trickled down to the people that really need it. So if you look at the numbers, there are parts of the state where public education is thriving and there are kids that are being prepared for life that are on a track to a career or college and um, this is one of those communities that is thriving. If you are African American in Mississippi, uh, there's a good chance you're not in a setting where you're getting a great education. If you are low income, there's an even greater chance that you're not going to have the chance to attend a great school and get a great education, and if you're special needs, there's a great chance you're not going to have what you need. And so we see this, I mean, I see it as like this sort of tale of two cities where you have communities in our state that are doing great and constituencies that are doing really poorly, and they're not seeing the benefit. And even some of our best communities, I mean, Oxford's a great example, thriving school district, uh, a lot of kids come out doing really well. The low-income students in Oxford have some of the biggest achievement gaps of anywhere else in the state. So the, certain students are doing great, certain students are doing not. So our vision for the solution is, and there's not, a, there's not an easy solution, there's not a silver bullet. We have focused on how do we empower those particular constituencies, <coughs> African Americans, low income and special needs, with additional education options so that parents can help make sure their kids in a better setting if the public school system has failed them. Now part of that means we gotta first do no harm. We don't wanna do anything to jeopardize those communities where education is working. But there's a lot of communities where it's not, and parents in those communities know it. And so at our core, we're a grassroots community organization that represents parents, not school systems, not, not districts, not mayors, not, we represent parents who are looking for something else. And I'm, I'm excited that there have been some proposals that have happened in the, uh, the last few years of the legislature that have worked to give parents more options. And where those 
programs have been created, the kids that are in those programs are thriving. And um, I think we just need to do more of that. Again, focused on those places that where families are being left behind. So we're gonna come back to this for sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rachel, what do you think? Um, what is the state of public education in Mississippi and what's the one thing our community do to make it better? <laughs> so I run an education policy nonprofit, so I think about this all day, every day, what we should do to make the system better. Let me first start with some of the things that Nancy and uh, Grant said about whether or not we're improving. So there's something called the National Assessment for Educational Progress, NAEP. It's also known as the nation's report card. It is the only source that we have of comparable student achievement data across all 50 states. And the longitudinal NAEP study has been going on since the 1970s. And then they have something called the short-term NAEP that's also been happening for the last couple of decades. So we have a lot of data over a long period of time. And what that data shows is that yes, Mississippi has been increased, has been improving over the last especially 20 years. At the same time, however, the nation has been improving as well, particularly in fourth grade. And it hasn't been until about the last decade that Mississippi started improving at a faster <coughs> rate than the nation. And so if you look at the way that the graphs look, it looks like this, where the nation is doing this and Mississippi is doing this, and it's only been in the last decade that Mississippi has really started to close that gap by improving faster than the national averages. Here is the problem. Those are <coughs> averages. If we break it out by high-income students and low-income students, if we break it out by white students and black students, we see that those gaps still persist. So we are not moving fast enough to close those gaps. So even though the state is improving, even though we are improving at a rate faster than the nation, which is what we need to do to close the overall gap, we still have big challenges, particularly in most with low income students, particularly with students who are not white. So that's good news and bad news. What that says is that we are doing some things right. We're just not doing enough of those things for enough. I think that if we want to look at everything that we've done in the last decade, we've passed a state-funded pre-kindergarten law. It does only reach 4% of kids, but then you have to add to it all the kids being touched by Title I pre-K, that brings it up to about 12%. If you add Head Start or if you add some other things, you start to get around 50% of kids who are in a publicly funded pre-K program. But there's varying quality across those things. So even though we know that pre-K there's 40 years of data behind the effect of high quality state funded pre-K that it can't actually, I should say there's 40 years of data behind high quality pre-K and there's now about 15 years of data behind high quality state funded pre-K that yes, you can do this at a statewide level and yes, it does make a difference. It's just that the studies are younger on that because state funded programs are younger. But what we know is that it has to be high quality. And there was a brand new study that is just out from Tennessee as of last week that says that if kids do not go into what they call a sustaining environment, so if they go from high quality pre-K into an elementary school that's not good, then you see the, that difference start to fade. But the good news is that what this new Tennessee study shows us is that if kids go into what's an, called a sustaining environment. So if they go into a high quality elementary school with high quality <coughs> teachers, that benefit they get from pre-K persists. They do better than kids who are also in high quality elementary schools but who did not go to pre-K, which tells us that yes, you do get an added boost and it does continue if you go into the right environment. So what does that tell us? That tells us we can't just have high quality pre-K even though it's incredibly important. We have to have great elementary schools, we have to have great middle schools, and we have to have great high schools. And to do that, we have to have a variety of things. We have to have rigorous standards, we have to be able to measure achievement well, while at the same time not taking away time from instruction by doing ridiculous test prep. We have to make sure that our teachers are prepared, are they're knowledgeable about their content, they have high quality curriculum that they can use to teach. And we have to be able to know that they're gonna be led in schools by leaders 
who are not going to make them want to quit their jobs because of all the ridiculous things that they may be asked to do. We've got to fund that kind of system. And so that, those are the things that we work on at Mississippi First to try to make the system better. We try to think through what are the big policy levers we can pull, how much is it going to cost, and when the rubber meets the road in a classroom, is this actually going to work for a child and a teacher? And we try to think through those things. I think we have incredible signs of hope in our data and in our state, but I also think we have to work harder and we have to work faster. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so before we get into the, the kind of specific questions, I want to try to go big picture, and this may not work, but let's give it a shot. Um, but thinking about um, sort of the big issues um, sort of boiled down is we have, you know, grants talks a lot about sort of school choice, um, ESA voucher program, um, charter schools and other reform this would be first, and Nancy is pretty much, you know, um, increasing funding for public schools and not use public money for private schools. Um, and trying to understand the differences between those philosophies and thinking about the idea of individualism versus the common good, right? The idea behind the creation of public schools is that they serve the common good, right? So even if you have, um, if you don't have any kids at home, you still pay taxes because a good public school system serves everybody in your community, that idea. Um, Whereas the arguments that I've seen for school choice often seem to rest on the idea of individuals. What's best for my kids? My kid needs a better environment so that she can learn. And so I'm going to do what's best for my, for my child. And that, that philosophical difference to me seems to be uh, undergirding a lot of this. And so is there a way to balance individualism with the notion of the common good? And how should our government education policy uh, address those issues of individual choice versus the common good? What should be paramount? Philosophical question, I promise we're going to get more specific. After. You want me to start again? Hey, I mean, you know, anybody want to jump in? I mean, I'd be curious about Grant's take on this. Sure. Um, I don't think we have to choose, and I don't think we should choose. Um, the reforms that we support do help individual people who are being left behind. But we are not going to support something that we think will have a detrimental effect on the common good of the whole. And so whether you're talking about charter schools, whether you're talking about education scholarship accounts, both of these are vehicles that have mountains of research to show that not only do they, over time, help the kids that opt into those, but they also help the community. And we could look at state examples of um, where Florida is a great example of this. We've talked about this before. Yeah. Florida. Uh, 15 years ago didn't have a lot of choices and they created a, an array of choices between charter schools, vouchers, uh, tax credit scholarships, ESAs, and in about 20 years you've seen their public schools skyrocket in their performance. Um, today in Florida, excuse me, today in Florida 46 percent of the kids in Florida attend a school not the one they're residentially assigned for. Now, ton of those kids, the vast majority are still in public schools. So they may be in a public school across town, or they may be in a public school around the corner, or they may be in a charter public school, or they may be in a private school using a, a choice vehicle. Um, but what has happened is you have a vast majority of kids that are thinking of education as something we should, we should, we should have options, we should demand that they be great options, and then we as parents opt to shop around and find the best setting because kids are not all the same and they are uh, you know our schools ought to be as unique, unique as our kids are um, so what you've seen in Florida is as at the same time they've introduced an array of choices empowered parents with all kinds of different options their public schools have skyrocketed in their achievement and Florida has seen some of the biggest gains in their in closing the achievement gap between their students of color and their traditional white students. And so our goal is not that you have to choose between those two. I think if we simply focus on the system and averages and seeing the average of the state lift, you're gonna end up leaving people behind who say, I don't care about the average, I care about my kid. My kid is a third grader and he doesn't know how to read because he's in a setting where they're not teaching him to read. And if we're just worried about averages, he's gonna get left behind. So 
we got to do some things to help the whole system at the same time provide some some options for the families that are not being helped by that system. Nancy, um, I'm going to keep on the idea of the common good and schools should serve that role. We'll talk a little bit about. Right, and, and what we know is that we, we have a public education system because we know that when we have an educated citizenry, everyone does better. Quality of life for everyone improves. And so that's why we all pay in to that system to make sure that all people can become educated and productive citizens. Um, and we know that when we start to chip away at that, it becomes extremely, first of all, it becomes extremely inefficient, okay? We, we can't afford to have a school for every child, right? I mean, that's just not efficient. That's why we all pay into one system so that we can have something that's good for everyone. And we also know that when you start to chip away at it and say, well, here's yours, you take it and go over there, and here's yours, and you take it and go over there, that's when we start to see the very, very dramatic discrepancies between the haves and the have-nots. And so what, we're really not talking about whether or not parents have choices. In our country, parents do have choices. What we're talking about is what we as taxpayers pay for. Those are two different things. Um, and so, so the idea is that we all chip in to provide something that's good that every single person has access to, everybody. No one can be turned away. The private schools that these vouchers in this whole school choice idea would go to, they, are ex they exclude children. That's why they're private. They pick and choose the children that they want to come to their school. And, the voucher law that we have, this ESA law that we have, is written for the schools. It's not written for the children. It says that the schools can choose or exclude whichever students they want to. They, they do not have to, it's supposed to be for children with special needs, but the schools don't have to provide any special education services, and overwhelmingly they do not. In most cases, the public schools go into those schools, which is so interesting because these parents are saying that they're not being served well in their public school, so they need to leave to go to the private school that doesn't provide any special education services. So the very public school that they left came over and coming over and providing the services. So, um, so, so that's the problem with the idea of this, the school of choice. It really isn't the parents that choose. It's the schools that choose. The schools choose the, the students that they want. And because of that, since we've had this ESA voucher program, less than half of the students who have been assigned vouchers have used them. They signed up, they said they wanted a voucher, they were assigned the vouchers, but they didn't use them, and their parents told our, the, the peer committee, which is like an investigative uh, evaluation committee uh, for the legislature, parents said that the reason they didn't use the vouchers was that schools didn't accept their children, the private schools wouldn't accept them, they couldn't find a school that met the child's needs, um, or the private schools also can charge tuition that exceeds sometimes dramatically what the voucher provides. And so some students, parents can afford to pay that difference and some cannot. But it's not a system where everyone has access. And that is a problem. And I think it is a violation of what, what the public education system and what we taxpayers were told would be done with our tax dollars when we contribute to them for the public school system. It's supposed to be a system for everyone. And school choice is an exclusive system where some participate and some don't. And that's, it's not always the case. We're gonna come back to this point, I am sure. Rachel, what are you, I mean, you know, I'm struck, and this is a bit of a topic. So, you know, I live in Jackson. And I have friends who make the rational decision to send their kids to a private school. It's because it's a better educational option, and I understand and respect that decision. But I know that it, that Jackson Public Schools has suffered because so many people of our socioeconomic class have made that decision. So balancing the in, what's best for my individual family versus what's good for the common good is one that, frankly, I wrestle with a lot. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. So, so. Uh, let me first start with, I also live in Jackson. Yeah. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. My five-year-old started kindergarten 
last week in Jackson Public Schools. But I also want to say my five-year-old started kindergarten in a selective enrollment school in Jackson Public Schools. And the reality is that even in our public education system, we have schools that <coughs> take their children, just like private schools take their children. And at Mississippi First, we support public school choice. So what that means for us is that we support traditional public schools that could be your neighborhood zone school. We support traditional public schools that have a different type of theme or environment or whatever, and we support charter schools as well because we consider all of those things to be within the public education system. The, I think the reality is that if you talk to a parent, the parent who is trying, to, who is looking at their neighborhood school, especially a parent who is not white and who is not high income, um, like me, and they might not be able to get their child in a selective enrollment school if one even exists in the community they're in. There might not be a public charter school. And they're looking at their neighborhood school and they're going, that's it? That's all, I, that's all I've got? And I, under, I, I understand and sympathetic to the argument of, well, why don't we just fix that school? But why don't we just fix that school is what we have been saying to those parents for the last 30 or 40 years. Why don't we just fix that school? And it's never children that look like mine that have to suffer through that. And so the reality is that we've got to do something different and we've got to be serious about it. That will probably look and does look very different on, in, in different communities. But I very strongly believe that we should not be telling parents within the public school system that you are locked into a school based on the the value of the house you could buy. And in Jackson, we've got, you know, we've got a very large school district that has been suffering for quite some time. We've had multiple people attempt to do things to fix it. And although I am more hopeful than I have been in a very long time with the new superintendent that's in Jackson, I also know the reality for a parent is that your child only gets to go to fourth grade once. And we cannot tell that mama well, just wait because so and so's here, and in five years, fourth grade will be better. When by that time, your child should be in algebra in ninth grade. And, you know, so I think, yes, we need to have an educated citizenry. Our responsibility is to children and to providing them the best possible school district that we can, to providing them the best po possible public option that we can. I think that we, <coughs> we cannot just close a blind eye to people and say, well, you just have to wait. It's very easy to say that if you sit in a position of privilege and you've never had to really agonize over the reality of where your child goes to school every single day. And some of us are very lucky to live in communities where we don't ever have to even think about, we just send our child down the road to the school. And others of us are not in those situations. And we cannot make policy that does not think about everybody in everybody's different situation. We support high quality public charter schools because we think if it's not quality, it's not a choice. And I think that when, when it comes down to it, a lot of the arguments that I hear for or against come into policy disagreements about whether or not the choice is a quality choice, whether or not the choice truly serves everyone. And I think that people come to the issue of choice from a philosophical place. I think people come to an issue of, of choice from a practical place, and you can also come to it from a research-based place, which is there's lots and lots of data about charter schools now and about what works and what doesn't, and if we're going to have them, they better work. And we don't, we've got six in the state of Mississippi right now, five are in Jackson, and uh, one is in Clarksdale. And those schools, they have to perform or they will be closed. But I don't think that just because, that we can pin all our hopes on those schools either, because six schools is not enough to serve the 25,000 children that are in the city of Jackson, for example. We do have to make the city of Jackson schools better. But at the same time, we've got to figure out how to tell that mama with the fourth grade child what she's going to do tomorrow when her child has to go to school. So yeah, I I I understand what what I understand the argument for or against, but parents. Parents, parents may say they believe in a common good, and they may, but when it comes down to their child, they very much believe 
that what the, the number one thing we cannot ask parents to sacrifice their children for a philosophical idea and for too long we have asked certain parents to sacrifice their children for a philosophical idea that other parents have never had to face that decision and so when when i hear people who say we shouldn't have public charter schools you know we shouldn't have public choice options then i i'm always curious have you ever been in that person's shoes? It, it is a very unique parent that would say, I'm willing for my child to have a bad education for this idea I believe in. I don't know the parent that would say that. You just answered all the questions. All right, so let me, uh, <laughs> that was great. And it also leads me into the next section, which is sort of, I guess I'm calling it the tough section, the <laughs> tough question section. Um, we fine tune this as we've gone through the tour. Um, so I think that you raised some really important questions, Rachel, that I think I want Nancy to talk about, which is, you know, and I know that Parents Campaign, while is strongly opposed to the ESA program, um, you're not necessarily opposed to charter schools, so you should talk about that. But, you know, we've been in Clarksdale, we've been in Jackson, uh, we're now here in Hernando. Um, Jackson and Clarksdale are low-rated school districts. Um, and, you know, it's relatively easy to support the public school status quo in places like Hernando, DeSoto County, Oxford, Rankin County, places that have highest GD district. So how do you respond to parents in places that don't have those choices, that don't have, that have struggling public schools? You know, why shouldn't they support expansion of the ESA program, for example? Because their children are not going to be served. I mean, they, that's the thing. We're not talking about their children. We're talking about bad choices. Um, if, if I really thought the ESA program was going to serve even a majority of children, because we always base our, our positions on what is the best option for the most children. Because unfortunately, we do, it's almost never that you have something that works for every single person. And so we always look at what serves the most children the best. And the ESA program is it doesn't even come close to meeting that standard. Um, we have an emergency on our hands. Absolutely. We have to solve this problem of uh, low performing schools for parents, for children, for children. Um, it is an emergency. And we need to elect, I mean, you've got an opportunity coming up. We've got a runoff coming um, in a couple of weeks, and then we've got a general election in November. But we need to elect some people who are ready to treat this like the emergency that it is. And we need to get back to real uh, a real legislative system that allows legislators to represent their people, where we have a committee, pro a real committee process, where we really de debate policy, we know what we're talking about, we see the bills before we're, they're asked to vote on them. I mean, our system is, you talk about a system that's broken, it's our legislative system that's broken, <laughs> far more broken than our education system is. Um, but we need people, and, and I think we have some opportunities to elect some people who are really serious about tackling this issue. But I will also say that not all of it can be or should be legislated. You can't write a law for every problem that we have in, in education. One of the biggest problems that we have that I think in, in large part was created by our legislature is a real crisis in a teacher shortage. We have a horrible teacher shortage, which means that we've got teachers in front of, we've got some classrooms that don't have a teacher. Um, and then we have others that have people who are not qualified to be standing in front of our children. And it's because, our, partly because, our legislature has made it so miserable, in some cases, for teachers to do that job, or more miserable. And so we, we just, there's so many things that we're not going to cover all the things. Nobody's going to touch on every for five hours thing. To right. five but it is an emergency. We never should ask a child to go to a school that isn't a high quality school. Never, ever. Um, but I also believe so strongly that saying to a, a few parents, we're going to give you the opportunity to go just choose whatever you want. And here's the other thing. 
these voucher laws, there, there is, we have no idea what quality education those children are getting. There is no accountability at all. And, and the proponents will say, oh, well, the only accountability we need is for the parents. If the parents are happy, they'll stay. And if they're not happy, they'll leave. Well, some parents are happy because their kids don't have any homework to do. But it doesn't mean that we're paying for a quality education. I mean, we know for a fact, research has shown us over and over and over again that the children in public schools outperform children in voucher schools. They do better. So what are taxpayers paying for? You know, well, why would we be asked to pay for an inferior education just because it's a parent's choice? Again, I am not for leaving children in inferior schools. I am not. I think we have an emergency on our hands. It's why I get up and do what I do every single day. But but telling a few parents, oh, you can have your choice. We'll pay for whatever school you want your child to go to or not at all, you know. You can go to a school where it doesn't matter if they show up or if they don't. Mm -hmm. That's not what our tax dollars should be used for. We should be investing in things like that. Yeah, so, so Greg, so, I respond to that. A couple of things. Um, oh, we're going to have accountability later, but. We'll come. <laughs> There might be a little accountability. All right, all right. Response, but, we can go back so this, the, the program she's talking about is the Special Needs ESA program. It was passed in 2015 in response to a crisis. In Mississippi at the time, we had a 23% graduation rate for students with special needs. Only 23 were graduating. You could talk to any parent in any community in the state, and you could talk to just about any teacher in the state, and they would tell you we had a special education crisis. So this program was created to address that crisis, not, not, I mean, it doesn't begin to address the statewide crisis, but to provide for some kids with special needs a, a, a solution. So it was created as a pilot program. Today, there's about 800 students in it. It has been a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket compared to the over $2 billion we spend on public education. But what has happened to those 800 families that are in the program? Well, this program said, first of all, you've got to have an IEP to even be eligible, which means that's a public school definition created through the federal IDEA program. And so these are all kids that have come from public school. Public school wasn't working for them. They needed a way out. So what do we know about the program? Well. There's about 800 families in it, 800 students in it. Uh, they're being served at over 90 different private schools around the state. They're not being served at one private school. They're being served at a range of private schools. There are a number of those families in this county that are being served. Um, they are, uh, the, the peer report that Nancy mentioned, the state-funded report said 91 percent of parents are satisfied with the existing program. The, the method of accountability in our public education system around special education has not worked. It is bureaucratic, it is top-down, it is heavy-handed, it is, there's a mountain of regulations that districts are supposed to be following to make sure kids with special needs have their needs served. That system wasn't working. Kids were not being served. No amount of top-down regulation and red tape and forcing it, forcing it was working. They were falling through the cracks. And so this program said, we're not gonna do that system again under a choice umbrella. We're not gonna turn private schools into public schools. We're gonna trust parents. If the districts have failed you, and again, we're not talking about every district, we're talking about isolated places where, where they were. We're gonna trust parents to find a way to meet their needs. And so this program doesn't give private schools any control, it gives parents control. Parents control the dollars. They can choose a better school for their child, and they can unchoose a better school for their child. And they can shop around, and they can say, well, this school is a better fit for my child because it has this program, or it has this special service, or it has this, or it's closer to my home, or it's safe. They're being served at over 90 different private schools around the state. And but there is no accountability. I mean, the new report found that there was no structure of accountability to make sure that those kids were progressing and the kind of testing requirements of public school space and private schools don't have. See, I jumped ahead to my accountability. Right. <laughs> so this is where we get into 
that we have allowed the, the, the conversation about accountability to be very myopic and defined very narrowly. When you talk to a parent and you say, um, how do we ensure that your child is gonna get a great education? That parent will tell you, well, first of all, I'm gonna make sure my child gets a good education. And if they don't, I'm the one you gotta deal with. Um, we've had parents in the ESA program who are, are pulling their hair out screaming because people are saying this program is not accountable. They're saying it's the most accountable of any program because if I don't, if my child is not getting a great education, I can take that, I can take my money and my child and I can go across the street. And they're doing that in places where parents have found that one setting was not the right setting. They can go across town to a different school. So I so wish, I, I wish. To tax payers. We're so, the ones paying the bill. So I wish public schools had the same accountability, at least some of the choice mechanisms that private schools have. The accountability, there's some, some base level accountability to taxpayers. First of all, only accredited private schools can, can qualify. Two, there's all kinds of uh, fraud mechanisms to make sure the money can only be spent on approved educational expenses, whether that's tuition or tutoring or therapy. So there's a lot of those kind of things. And at the end of the day, this is a test to see can we, by giving parents the, the, the charge of accountability, can we ensure they get a better education? I would be okay if there were a testing component in the ESA program. And there's been a, I mean, there was a political debate about it when it was passed in 2015. There's, there's been lots of behind the scenes debate about whether or not there ought to be a testing component. What I don't want to happen is what some states have done is where they have regulated it so much that all the best private schools in the state say, I don't want anything to do with that. And so then you be, it becomes this program where only the poor performing or the bad private schools accept it. So you have to be careful that you don't overregulate. Overregulate it. Louisiana did this. Louisiana added all of these requirements on on private schools. They said you can only charge this much tuition. You have to take these state tests. Well, a lot of private schools, the vast majority, don't want to take the state test because they see the testing crisis that's going on in public education and the hours and hours of test prep and the students that are stressed out of their mind and they say we don't want to do that. So they want a different model now. Most private schools take a nationally norm reference test. They vary, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a handful of those that most private schools take. Um, I would have no objection if the legislature decided to say, kids in the ESA program ought to take a nationally norm reference test and those test results sh uh, should be included in the next round of peer report. That's, I mean, I'd okay. be fine with that. All right. um, so I forgot to ask you your tough question, Grant, so let me go for that one. That was Nancy asked that. Yeah, I know. Um, and, 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 and it has to do with transparency, and we've talked about this before. And, you know, I have great, you know, kind of respect for your coming out in these forums and, and making the case in a very strong way for your beliefs on this. Um, but sometimes it seems like Empower Mississippi is not always so transparent. Um, and you can disagree on it. Yes, I can too. Um, I'm thinking about the last day of the legislative session in which expansion of DSAs was done in a very kind of quiet, surreptitious way. It was snuck into the bill. We voted on it, but didn't know what they were voting on. It was done kind of behind closed doors. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention here, you know, up here in Minnesota County, that Empower has gotten involved in political campaigns, yep. kind of mailing things that didn't work, you know that weren't about arguing the merits of school choice, but about other things. So how do you respond to those that transparency question. Why, you know, um, um, you know, why isn't Empower always um, working to make that explicit argument for the value of school choice? Well, we are. We're, we, we take every opportunity we get, which is why I'm I know. thrilled you to be driving up over the state with you talking about choice yeah. and, 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 and ultimately how do we lift people that are not being served. Um, so why not debate that on the floor of the legislature and pass it through normal oh, procedures? Uh, look, I, I would completely agree with Nancy that our legislative process is broken. Yeah. Um, they don't have hearings. I wish they did. Um, the very fact that a chairman of education, one person, can sit on a bill that the entire rest of the membership would like to see out, would like to vote on, would like to pass, um, is not transparent. So. 
the way this session came down, uh, I mean, like that, that happened this session, that's happened multiple sessions, but the chairman of education in the house single-handedly stopped the rest of the membership from supporting any number of education bills. Um, that's not Democrat. The way it happened at the end of the session was as much a surprise to me as it was everybody else. Um, the lieutenant governor was real transparent after the fact about what he did. He said, I had lots of families with special needs that came inside of my office and said this is really important to us and we've been accepted into a program, we're on a waiting list. Um, and been, so many of these families have been on a waiting list for four years and they were pulling their hair out and they're watching their kids grow up and fall further and further behind. And the legislature had made a promise to create this program and grow it every year and they hadn't delivered on it. And so he took matters into his own hands and it wasn't just him, there were chairman on both sides, there was the speaker on, both, on, on the house side. Um, the governor that they said we're gonna get it into a bill and get it done and so they did but I mean from the beginning of the session we show up with our agenda we say here's what we're trying to do it's not hard to figure out what we would like to accomplish it's just the legislative process that's messy um, all right Rachel I'm gonna merge two tough questions into one <laughs> for Daniel Hunt, because I know you can handle it um, and uh, you know one of the things so charter schools have just kind of got off the ground here in Mississippi. Um, they've been around for a lot longer in other parts of the country. And, and I've read things, and I'm sure I haven't read a fraction of what you've read, so you can push back on my premise. But, but I seem to be reading more articles that there's kind of like, people are kind of assessing whether charters have really been successful. There was the report that came out um, called Asleep at the Wheel, I think, about, about how looking at those charter schools around the country that got grants from the federal government to help come. And a, a significant percentage failed or never even opened. I think um, in Arkansas, 52% of the schools that got those federal grants failed within a few years or never opened, 57% in Georgia. So are charter schools, I mean, you know, what flaws are there? And how can we make sure that if we're embarking on a new system of charters in the city, that they're effective and we're not going to do what other states have done in terms of seeing this high failure rate. Sure. So Mississippi First is very explicit about our opinion on charter schools. We support high quality charter schools because as I said before, if it's not quality, it's not a choice for us. The, there is, let me back up and start with a little bit of history on charter schools. So the first charter school law, the first modern charter school law, which is what we know is the charter school movement in America now, was passed in Minnesota in 1990. They were intended to be laboratories of innovation to try new and different educational practices that then could inform the entire system of public education about what might work better for kids in certain circumstances or any kid or all kids. Um, and over the course of the last three decades, we've seen the, the laws expand across the country. There are now charter school laws in 42 or 43 states, including Washington, D.C. And they have, and they're all different, although they share a lot of similarities. So when you start to talk about charter school policy, it's important to talk about what are you talking about? Are you talking about charter schools in a state that has this type of law or that type of law? Because depending on the choices that policymakers make, you can get very different things in your system. So for example, in Mississippi, we have a requirement that charter schools be open enrollment. You cannot select your children. You can't select them on the basis of academic ability, uh, income. You can't select them on the basis of any sort of special skill like athletic ability or artistic ability, et cetera. In Louisiana, they have multiple types of charter schools and there is one type of charter school where you can have selective enrollment charter schools and you can have, for example, an arts charter school and every child has to audition in order to get into it. Mississippi does not allow that in our law. So sometimes I hear people saying, well, in New Orleans this, and I have to say, well, wait a minute, what type of charter school are you talking about in New Orleans? Because they're not all the same as what Mississippi has. What about for-profit, non-profit? Right, so in Mississippi, for example, we are one of the states that says you can only have non-profit charter schools. For-profit charter schools are not allowed. These are things that, because Mississippi passed our law much, much later than many other people, we tried to learn from the mistakes that other states made 
and make sure that our law have the types of policies in it that's more likely to lead to a high performing charter sector. When the charter schools first started, there was a big question around, do they actually work? Because if they don't actually work, then we're just replicating the dysfunction of schools that we already have. Why would we do and that? competing for the same teachers or teacher shortage. So, so there has been a lot of studies about this. One of the researchers that has done the most work on this is an organization out of Stanford University called Credo. They do studies where they basically try to compare two identical children, one of whom went to a charter school and one of whom went to the school that they would have gone to had they not gone to the charter school and said, do they do better? Because you don't want to compare apples and oranges. It's not fair to compare a kid who is from a high income family who has every single advantage in life to a child who has very few advantages in life and say, okay, well this child did better that's not really fair. So what they try to do is they do something called virtual twin studies. And what Credo found is that it really does matter what state you're in. Some states do way better than others, but on the whole, their urban charter school studies show that for children in urban charter schools, they outperform their traditional public school peers. And the effect is cumulative, which means the longer a child is in a charter school, the better they do. So they do better after the first year, but after the fourth year, they do a lot better than their Those traditional are in average school. districts or like low performing districts? These are in urban districts across the country. So this is the urban charter school study. These and the, the finding was very strong. And what's really interesting about it is that here in Mississippi, we have Jackson that has charter schools and we have Clarksdale. Okay. So Jackson Charter Schools, we're so new that we've got schools that are in, going into their fifth year for the first time this year. We have two schools going into their fifth year. Their data about their fourth year performance will come out in September. So it will be very interesting to see, do we see this trend true in Mississippi with our Jackson Charter Schools? Now there's only two, so that's a little unfair because it's not very many. But, you know, we, if you follow the research, the expectation is if we have done our job in terms of selecting people who know how to do this and holding them accountable for it, we will see those kids outperform their peers. If you go into the charter schools in Jackson and you look at the schools and you look at the children, you look at the families, they are the exact same children and families who are in traditional public schools in Jackson. They do not look like me. They do not have, you know, two Harvard educated parents. They are people who are low income and living in the city of Jackson and they were desperate for their child to get a better education than they would have gotten if they had gone to their neighborhood school. Um, the, the research on rural schools or suburban charter schools is not as good. There is also not as much of it because for a long time, charter schools were an urban school district phenomenon where they were opening in large cities. Uh, Detroit, DC, Boston, San Francisco, it's new to have them, or newer to have them in rural and suburban schools. So we're gonna be looking at the Clarksdale School really carefully to see how that one performs. One of the consistent findings though within the research nationwide, regardless of urban, rural, et cetera, is that kids who are in traditional public schools that do not move to a charter school perform no worse once a charter school opens than they did before. There's a dispute about whether they perform better because of some sort of competition effect. Um, there's mixed studies on that, but there are really no rigorous studies that show they perform worse. And there's not really an average charter too. I mean, there's a wide disparity. There's, yes. So our position has always been, we need to look at what works, we need to do what works, and if a school is not gonna perform better than a traditional public school, it's not really a choice and it needs to close. And there are strong mechanisms in the charter school law to allow for that. But as a research-based organization, we do not take our opinions from philosophy, from party, from you know any from a donor. We read studies, we try to figure out what works, and then we try to translate that into this what will work in our state, in all the complexity that Mississippi is. And you know, I personally had a long progression coming to the place where I am in, for charter schools because back in the 
er, late 90s, early 2000s, when I first started to understand what charter schools were, the data just wasn't there yet, and I had very mixed feelings about it. And over the last 20 years, I've really come around to believing very strongly in the power of high quality public charter schools because the data is there. And if you go into Reimagine Prep in Jackson, if you go into Smilo Collegiate, if you go into Clarksdale Collegiate, you will feel how wonderful those school environments are. You will see how invested the children and the families are and the teachers are in the success of those children. And it will give you goosebumps. Can I add, can I add yeah. one thing? I'll give you a compliment here. I do. I love the, the, the this three-part panel because yeah. you get little slices of differences in places where we agree and disagree. Yeah. Um, one place where I would disagree from Rachel, and I would just take it a little further, is where she said, if it's not better than the traditional public school, that's not a choice, and she would, Mississippi First would support closing it down, which I, I can respect that. This is, this is a, it's a hot topic in Jackson because we got a school that is on the verge. They're, they're trying to decide, are they better than a traditional public school or not? They've been rated an F. There's a question about whether they'll be a D this year. And we would argue, we would just look at more indicators than simply achievement test scores to decide whether they're successful or not. Wouldn't that be great if all public schools had that same? Yeah. Sure. And, and, I, and I support that. Yeah. I would support our accountability yeah. system having more yeah, yeah, no, for inputs sure. than it does. That's the problem of like a single test and a single letter grade. And, and oh, that school's a C, that school's a B. That school must be better because it's one letter grade better when it's so much more. But the charge but they're, look at, they're measured the same way. You no, know, I know. Maybe so the problem is that. So, so I'm not saying I, I'm arguing for them to be measured differently. I'm saying I'm yeah. arguing for them. I'd love to see public schools measured more broadly. Yeah. And the, the way Rachel described the, in, the inside of these charter schools, it is that. I mean, it, it gives you goosebumps. And, and each of these charter schools have a long waiting list of parents to get in. They're lined up at the door to get in. Now, they're not selecting students, but if they, they'll say we have 300 spots or 500 slots, and if you get 512, then 12 people are, they're gonna draw names out of the hat, and 12 people are gonna get left out. But the very fact that you've got a long waiting list high retention rates, amazing things going on in the building, and achievement scores are not, uh, there's only one school that's really even a question, and they're not, they're above Jackson Public, they're not a ton above Jackson Public. In my mind, I wouldn't dream of shutting that school down today, simply because the parents love it, there's a waiting list, there's demand for it, but there, but this is this is the crux of sort of the, within the focus what of the charter. What is the how do we do it? And you know, of course, my answer would be, why can't we figure out, you know, how to take those goosebump elements of the school and apply them to more traditional schools? And I and I think on that question, because yeah. people ask me that all the time, and the reality is that one of the reasons that high performing charter networks started was because they couldn't get traditional public schools to listen to them about how to change their practices, and they got so upset, and fed up. They said, "Fine, we're going to open our own schools." And that's the history of many of these high-performing charter networks, is that they started as traditional public school teachers, right. or they started in a traditional system, and then they said, okay, no more. KIPP, for example, started two teachers yeah. in Houston public schools, in classrooms, starting a program within their regular public school. And then when they wanted to grow, they found out that they had to go start a charter school to really continue that. And I think one of the, one of the the things we've got to figure out is that your schools are only going to be as strong as your governance. Charter schools are governed by nonprofit boards and they can be closed if they don't do it right. I have real questions around, and I don't know what the better system is, but I have real questions around whether school boards are the, the right system of governments to really make broad and deep change for kids in America. I don't know what a better system is. I think nobody really knows. I think we're still trying to figure that out as a research question. But I think we need to be open to the idea that if we want great schools, we have to govern them well. Nobody wants to work for a terrible boss. If you walk in and you see some of these school board meetings and the district is a mess, you go to the school board meeting and you're like, well, that school, that's why the district is a mess. Have you been here? It's like a circus. So we've got to figure out, okay, if it's not school boards, what is it? Is there a way to figure out how do we make sure that every single person from the very top to the very bottom is there for kids, is there to do what works, 
and he's going to do that in a rigorous way every single day and not be there because of power or money. And that's or easier to do on a smaller scale than in a large system scale. Yeah, and that's, that's the challenge that everybody's trying challenge. to figure out. Right. And that's one of the things that I was going to say, too, is that a, a huge difference between charter schools and traditional public schools is that charter schools are allowed to limit their enrollment. And traditional public schools do not. And when you can keep your school tiny and small, it is so interesting. And, and again, we at the parents campaign, we don't oppose charter schools. We endorse the bill that passed. We've helped, we worked really hard to improve it. We, we helped to improve that bill a lot. So a lot of the things that Rachel said were the strong qualities of that bill, we insisted be in there. Um, but when you when you have these these systems where that are so large. It's, it's, di it's difficult to have the same kind of intimate feel that you have in a charter school. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is a basic difference. That, and it's so interesting to me that some of the same people that um, advocate for charter schools also advocate for consolidating school districts. So they want our pu traditional public schools to be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But they want, and each of these charter schools is its own school district. So it's, it's okay in their mind to have these tiny, tiny <coughs> 200 <coughs> student school districts that are charter schools, but they want all their traditional schools to be forced into these enormous systems. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think we need, to, we need to take a serious look. We, we need to be serious about it. We need to be serious about it. This whole one size fits all, you know, we gotta save money here, but it's fine to, you know, have teeny tiny schools over here. But I, I will just yeah. say that I think the question of scale is an important one. And yes, we do need to, how to, need to figure out how to do excellence at scale. I think we've got some school districts in the country that have figured that out better than others, but we don't really have like a really great example of There's doing no it at, at, you know, huge scale. But I will say that charter schools are actually limited by the state and the number of kids that they can take. In their contract, they have a number and they cannot have more than 10% of kids over that number. They can't accept them. Um, and this has been true of charter schools for, since 1991. And actually, it's because of traditional public schools want to limit the number of kids that can go to charter schools. And so as part of this whole system, they say, well, you can only have 500 kids. So. You know, it's true that if you moved into a neighborhood and you had a neighborhood zone school and you had a child and they had 300 chairs and you showed up with a 301 child, they would have to find another chair for your child to sit because that's how zone schools work. Charter schools do not work that way, but it is equal opportunity in the sense that unlike a zone school where you have to buy a house to be allowed to go there, you get allowed to go to a charter school if you live in the school district and you have um, a child who's of the right age, and then you go into a lottery if there are more people who want to go. So yeah, there are pros and cons to these systems, but there's also a history behind why they are the way they are. They are. And I think that we have to, if you go into a school like Clarksdale Collegiate, you can see immediately there are things that should be transferable between that elementary school and other elementary schools. And no, Clarksdale Collegiate is one school, so it doesn't have the whole apparatus of a central office and a superintendent and a director of this and a director of that. We've got to figure out how to do excellent schools that have you know, all of that in addition to just one excellent school. All right, well, I promised it's time for audience questions, so that means we're so we're going to have to punt on equity till next time, but I think there's some interesting stuff to be done. But are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It seems like money is a big problem in the United States. Is that right? Money is a big problem for everything, but I have a vain question. I can stop rolling my voice off. That's fine. I can hear that. Um, I can understand but you clearly. I want to know about the budget that I'm interested in the soda can and how this works. Mississippi did some from Jackson and Dennis to Soda County. 
to him is responsible for our budget or is it a work together thing? Ma'am, you asked the perfect question that actually covered the issue that I wanted to cover. So thank you. Uh, so, so you'll talk about how local districts are funded and, and maybe work. So, um, so for example, I was talking to actually Melinda earlier who is a assistant principal here in DeSoto County, but is on the school board in Tate County. So how are those schools funded? How much of it comes from local? How much of it comes from state? How does NAEP fit into this? Someone want to answer that? I'll, I'll yeah. say it. So all schools, almost all schools in America have three main sources of money. They have state money, they have local money, and most schools in America also have some federal money but it's gonna dramatically vary how much federal money they get because federal money is based on the type of student that you serve. So for example, you get money for ch children with special needs and so if they have IEPs under IDEA, you would get money for them. But that those dollars are not general operating dollars. They can't go to fund just anything if they're federal. So most, most of the money is gonna come from state and local sources. The way that our state works, we have a funding model where the state basically says we are going to guarantee you a minimum amount of money for every child. And then depending on the wealth of your school district, you're going to have to pay a different portion of that state guarantee depending on how wealthy your school district is. Now above that amount, if you have more money, you can raise local property taxes above that amount to have additional local dollars. So there's there is a state base with what a lot of people call the base student cost, and that is the minimum guarantee. And then there's going to be most of that, much of that's going to be state, but depending on where you are, there's going to be a larger or smaller portion that is local, and then you're going to have additional local funds. The reason that every child in Mississippi does not get the same amount of dollars for their education is because local wealth varies. And when I say local wealth, I don't mean, I don't exactly mean the wealth of students. I mean property wealth, because we have some school districts that have very poor kids, but have extremely um, high dollar value property. And so you can tax the, the plant, for example, even though the kids don't, like their family might not be wealthy, but the school district has a lot of money because that plant has a lot of money. Here in DeSoto County, you have um, certain areas of the county that have like big economies where you know you've got the suburbs of Memphis lots of people live here there's lots of money here um, so you might have be able to raise more money than Cahoma County for example they're not going to have as much property wealth they will not be able to raise as much money the other thing on the flip side though is that DeSoto County has lots and lots of children it's the largest school district in the state and because of that even though there's a lot of wealth, a lot of money here, it's got to go across all of those kids. So if, if depending on the way that we might talk about <coughs> changing the system, DeSoto County actually was one of this, the counties that would have gotten more money out of the Edville rewrite because there are so because DeSoto County is increasingly diverse. And even though there's a lot of money in this county, there's a ton of kids, right. and so a lot of money and a ton of kids means that you still don't have a lot of money per kid. And you cannot operate on the 1802 budget. <laughs> in 2019, I don't know what will look. Who is responsible for the budget in the Soda County? Now look, Tennessee got a $35 billion grant. Last year, Jennifer Boy School was out it was on the news and they announced and that can be used for metal detectors and scanners and y'all all you talk about is and there's all that great need but if our children and the teachers and the workers cannot go to school and feel secure so the, the that, needs, that needs to be the top priority, and I tell you, my grandson goes to the Zoe Central. This is my son. This is his son, yeah. daughter. Um, they were out of town. They had that bomb threat. So you caught him, you know, 50, 
Safety is certainly a national issue that we're all wrestling with in this in this time. Man, you had a question. Yes. So uh, when I moved here 25 years ago, uh, there weren't any charter schools, but there are so many homeschool parents. And uh, in my opinion, the move to tra charter schools is to answer the need that homeschool parents had to uh, to take their children out of public schools, but still give them some kind of an, uh, education. The problem that I have is paying for it. As a taxpayer, I think charter school is a business, and you should pay for your business and not ask the taxpayer to pay for it, especially when it comes at the expense of our public schools. So what do you have to say about that, that you are a business and you are asking the state to pay for your business? Well, thank you for your question. I think the way I would frame it is by definition, in Mississippi, charter schools can't be businesses because our law says you have to be a nonprofit. So these are not people that are profit motive people. They're not people coming together because they're going to make a profit. I mean, there's just there's not profit involved. And all the money has to be invested back in the school. But other states, and not in Mississippi, but there's examples of people who are paying themselves as administrators sure. huge salaries and yeah. profiting yeah. in a nonprofit. Yeah, that's yeah. and that's a horrible abuse of taxpayer dollars. And I'm yeah. glad we. We do not have that here. Right, okay. So, I mean, so. But there's no accountability in your system. Just like homeschool kids are not tested to so, see if they so get an education. School. It's the same thing with the charter schools. I heard you say they are not tested. I so, no, they are. They are. They are. They are. The charters charters are. Are. If they leave the school, the charter school, and go back to the public school, then are they tested when they get to the public school to get in? Like homeschool kids are tested to see where they. Uh, where they uh, level out or do they go to the same grade? So charter schools are just like traditional public schools. They take all the same tests. So if they leave a charter school at the end of third grade and they go to a traditional public school in fourth grade, they have their third grade test scores and they it transfers. If you look at charter schools and charter school parents and charter schools uh, families, these are, these are not homeschool families. They are traditional public school families who have decided that the public school that they're in is not serving their child and they're going to a different public school. It's just a charter public school. I think that maybe you might have some, some um, misunderstandings around the difference between the voucher program that Nancy and Grant were talking about and the charter schools because the voucher program is the one where we were talking about they don't have to be tested. But charter schools actually have Those extreme extreme rigorous accountability. Not only do they have to take all the same assessments, they also have annual um, measures around their financials, measures around the organizational. It's all, everything is a public record. They have to have public meetings. They are bound by not all of the same things that traditional public schools are, but many of the same things as traditional public schools. And if you're interested, and um, you know, not that I'm saying you should get in your car and drive to Jackson, but if you look at on the websites for the charter schools, there's the three charter schools run by Republic um, schools. There's a Midtown Public Charter School. There is Clarksdale Collegiate, and now there's Ambition Prep. If you go and you read about those schools, you'll see that they're radically different from what we're talking about when we talk about like a homeschool environment where there's no um, state requirements pretty much for anything in a homeschool environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe one last question. I wanted to have clarified about who is responsible for setting up the Tresota County Education, but who does that? So the state, the state money that is determined by the legislature. They I vote on that, and who then who puts the, in the Tresota County money? Who set that? So the, the school board. Like so the school board would decide what the budget is. They would give it to the supervisors to raise the taxes. Okay, so that's who sets it up the school board. The board supervisors. And I'll tell you, ma'am, that um, next month we will be having our panel. We'll be focused exclusively on the Soto County schools. So that's a, you know, a certainly good issue that could be brought up then. Um, uh, 
we've kind of come to the end of our seven o'clock. I appreciate your being here. Um, this was this is intended to be the kind of you know the kind of policy larger picture type discussion. Our program September seventeenth really will and the limit. All right, you go. I will talk in power now because I'm sorry you're exclusive. I'm, I'm sorry. With you other two ladies, I have two words. It's called parents. Thank you. And it's called good teachers. Yes. That's that's your answer to all your problems. Yeah. Parents, they're doing their jobs. And thank God I'm in Stoke County. We have tons of them. Mm -hmm. That make that's what makes the Stoke County so great. And that's why we struggle with hate. Okay? And good teachers. Um, you talk about the, the walking into the charter school and giving me goosebumps, it's because good teachers. And I, I'm proud to say I am a part of the high school, and we have some of the best teachers in the state down the hallway, and it does give me goosebumps. But until we can make sure that the Clark Sales and the Tate Counties of Mississippi have good teachers and parents, we're always going to. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's a good one. And, and sort of one issue that we brought up before and we'll probably discuss again is teacher shortage and how do we attract good teachers. And one of the, and I should be on there. I won't. Thank you so much. For the well, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. Well,